Welcome to those of you that are joining us. We will get started in a few minutes. In the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Just make sure that you select everyone when you're using the chat function. We also have just this slide up with some housekeeping items. So your cameras and microphones are disabled. So please use that chat function for any questions, comments or support. Um, and there's gonna be 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you're participating today to receive CME or CEU credit, you will need to attend for 45 minutes or more to receive your certificate. And all participants who'd like to receive credit will need to complete the evaluation survey after the session, which will be placed in the chat for you. And it will also be sent out to you via email. And then CME and CU certificates will be sent out via email by November 11th, along with a link to the recording of today's session, the slides, and also a list of related resources. And all of those materials will be uploaded to our website next week, so you can find them there as well. Um, and then also in the chat, we are placing a link to the Health Professional Impact Survey, which is just an opportunity for you guys to let our funders know about how BHIP has improved your practice and your responses and feedbacks will play an active role in BHIP's ongoing development, improvement, and expansion. So if you have some time while we're waiting, please feel free to check that survey out and we will get started soon.
So we will get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lily Stavisky and I'm the Outreach and Training Coordinator for BHIP. I'll be introducing our presenter for today and also facilitating the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, we have this slide up with just a few things to remember. So your cameras and microphones are disabled. So please use the chat function. If you have any questions, comments, or if you need support, just make sure you select everyone from the drop down menu when you're typing in the chat. And there's gonna be 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If you're participating today to receive CME or CU credit, you will need to attend for 45 minutes or more to receive your certificate. And all participants who'd like to receive credit will need to complete the evaluation survey after the session, which will be placed in the chat for you and it will also be sent out to you via email. Um, and then CEU and CME certificates will be sent out via email by November 7th, along with a link to the recording for today's session, the slides and a list of related resources. And then all of those materials will also be uploaded to our website next week for you to access as well. For those of you that are unfamiliar with BHIP, I'd just like to provide some information about our program. So Maryland Behavioral Health Integration and Pediatric Primary Care, or BHIP, is a child psychiatry access program that supports the ability of pediatric primary care providers and emergency medicine professionals in addressing and managing the mental health concerns of their patients. And BHIP is a free statewide program that offers telephone consultation, resource and referral networking, telemental health services, and training and educational opportunities. And our BHIP warm line is staffed by a team of child mental health specialists, and it's available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And we will put our phone number and website in the chat for you as well. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's BHIP webinar, Assessment and Management of Trauma-Related Symptoms in Pediatric Primary Care, presented by Dr. Rihanna Platt. Dr. Platt is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the medical director of the Latino Family Clinic at Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center and a consultant on the BHIP team, supporting the efforts of pediatric primary care providers to assess and manage the mental health needs of their patients. Her research interests include the implementation of mental health and family psychosocial screening in pediatric primary care settings and mental health promotion within primary care and community-based settings. We are very grateful to have you here today, Dr. Black. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us during this session. And I will hand it over to you. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Let me just uh, share my screen. And I would should say probably the the um, <clears throat> maybe the most important part of my background is that I also trained as a pediatrician uh, before going into psychiatry and child psychiatry. So um, you know this is the topic, and BHIP is sort of near and dear to my heart for those reasons. Um, I uh, don't have any conflicts of interest to discuss. I'm, as Lily mentioned, I'm faculty and I will discuss um, off-label use of medication. I'll let you know when we do that. And part of that is because there is, based on the, the topic today, uh, there is limited uh, sort of FDA approved medications, particularly for pediatric populations. So the objectives, I'll talk a little bit about PTSD, and I and we'll talk a little bit about the challenges of diagnosing and some other sort of controversies in diagnosing PTSD. Um, we'll talk a little bit about differences in presentation by age. Um, also talk a little bit about factors that promote resilience, and then give a little introduction to sort of evidence-based treatments for PTSD as well. Um, so just to, you know, just to kind of uh, begin, PTSD is really um, part of sort of what we would say like a family of, of uh, disorder, we should say disorders, but a lot of these have to do with like the, you know, the, the uh, experience of, tra of traumatic events can lead to a lot of different presentations. So some of those might be in the acute period afterwards. Um, in other cases, um, we'll talk a little bit about sort of disinhibited social engagement and reactive attachment as different ways of, of um, you know, responses to trauma. But really all of this is just to say that PTSD is really one potential presentation, but as you guys have probably seen in your practice, there's many different potential responses to traumatic events. Um, in terms of um, criteria for PTSD, and we'll talk a little bit about this most recently, there's been sort of discussion and, you know, I think as, as 
we're probably all used to in the pediatric world. A lot of times things are sort of developed with adults and retrofitted for pediatric patients. And this is one area where there's been some pushback, like, hey, this, there's actually some developmental differences. So we'll talk a little bit about how criteria for PTSD have changed, including um, that it's changed for based on age. Um, so for children older than six, um, the necessary criteria for PTSD include exposure to, um, you know, again, this a lot of this is sort of um, adult related language, right? Death, injury, or other violence, um, or other violent events. A lot of this, again, in the perspective of youth, they how people interpret trauma is really important in terms of whether something's experienced as, you know, our, so our sort of assessment verse of it versus the assessment of the child, and that this changes over the course of development. For a formal diagnosis of PTSD symptoms, um, usually have to last, once you kind of had symptoms for more than one month, you move from like a, an acute stress reaction to more chronic presentation, which is encompassed in PTSD. And then we'll talk a little bit about the sort of families of symptoms um, that are usually required for the diagnosis. Um, so for children older than six, usually, um, and we'll go through this sort of briefly, I want to also make sure we have time for questions and make sure this is sort of meeting folks' needs, but they're, you know, really characterized by symptoms in these four different categories, one being intrusion, one being avoidance, one being cognitive, and one being arousal. So intrusion, symptoms of intrusion um, would include things like mem you know, intrusive memories, nightmares, dissociations, or even sort of reactions with, um, with um, exposure to a uh, cue, which is sort of a, a sign or something that reminds them of the trauma. Um, there's also cognitive symptoms. Um, and again, as we think about kids and their cognitive development, you can see how this would need to change. And, you know, perhaps we should be thinking not just six and above. There's a lot of changes that happen between six and 12, 12 and 18, for example. Um, but some cognitive symptoms, um, there need to usually be two, and that would include um, you know, inability to remember aspects of the event, um, cognitive symptoms that we typically um, think of sometimes as characterized by depression, um, which would be like negative beliefs about yourself, um, distorted thoughts about the event, um, and a sense of detachment. Then there's avoidance, um, which, um, you know, is has some overlap, right, with anxiety um, in terms of um, efforts to avoid things that remind them of the event or the feared event, um, including not just places, but things that remind them. Um, and then the arousal symptoms. And I think this is where um, sometimes we see the most variability of presentation. Um, it can be anything from sort of being irritable, having really significant tantrums, um, all the way to more what we say like reckless behavior, um, and then things that sometimes appear. So difficulty with concentration um, can be sort of a primary presentation. So you can see with these how there's definitely potential overlap um, with other types of um, disorders and symptoms. And then sleep problems, which we'll get to because that's really one of the areas where there's some evidence for potential pharmacologic management. Um, for kids who are um, six and younger, and I sort of alluded to this before, um, in the DSM-4, we're now in the sort of revision of the DSM-5, but um, again, you could imagine how some of those would, we'd have difficulty sort of applying them to children who are um, the youngest, and that how people interpret sort of these intrusive symptoms. So sometimes you'll see someone um, sort of, uh, their play might be sort of reenacting the event, and they may not appear distressed by it, but it's still sort of intrusive in terms of how it's affecting their functioning. Um, there's fewer, for kids under six, there's fewer um, cognitive symptoms required. And again, part of that is because these because kids are in the process of sort of cognitive development. Um, again, this, this I sort of alluded this to this before, but that arousal symptoms can include um, extreme ten temper tantrums. Um, which we wouldn't necessarily, you know, the equivalent of that in an adult um, it might be a little bit different. Um, with this new criteria, um, there was an increase, which again suggests, right, that that um, we maybe were missing um, some of the younger kids before because of the kind of more adult-focused criteria that was there. 
So in terms of, I'm going to now go through sort of the families of symptoms a little bit more. So the intrusion symptoms, so these can be triggered by trauma cues and sometimes, and we'll get into this, you know, I, I know that there's been sort of a lot of discussion around um, trauma-informed care and, you know, being aware of potential cues. And sometimes what seems like a cue to, you know, it, it may not be completely obvious, right? That it could be a sight, a sound, you know, potentially a sound that reminds them of something or smell of something that we may not be aware that it is potentially a cue that's sort of triggering um, these intrusive symptoms. As I mentioned before, in younger children, this might just be repetitive play. They may be acting out the details of the event, but they may not report being sort of distressed by it. Um, and then importantly, um, you know, I think for nightmares, oftentimes people may have nightmares. It may or may not. I think historically we had thought that, oh, the nightmare really needs to be about the event, but that's not necessarily required as part of the, um, as a, a symptom of intrusion. Um, in terms of avoidance symptoms, um, so again, you know, there's distress, uh, avoidance of um, not wanting to re-experience potential symptoms or the, the event that they had before. So they may um, experience distress when they have reminders. They might try to avoid discussing the event um, or even try to sort of push away memories of the event. Um, and then the people, places, and activities. And this is where we can really start to see challenges with respect to functioning. Um, obviously, we want to ensure that the places where kids are are safe. And so there's, you know, we struggle, I think, sometimes if there's a traumatic event that happens in school and we want, and school is physically, you know, objectively not safe, we don't, you know, want to necessarily have someone go in an unsafe environment. But the more sort of restricted, kids are in terms of their ability to be in the environment, the less opportunities there are to kind of continue on a normal developmental trajectory. Um, then in terms of going into a little bit more depth with the cognitive symptoms, so, um, you know, you'll see that some of these are sort of diminish interest or activity, diminish interest or uh, motivation, and then negative emotions, like there is a fair amount of overlap with um, symptoms of depression. Um, there are difficulties or can be difficulties attaching to or connecting to others. Um, you'll see in some kids, it's actually goes in the opposite direction. So if they're sort of disinhibited and attachment, um, you know, to sort of anyone without sort of um, regard or assessment versus um, not wanting to attach to folks. And then, you know, these negative, you know, the common, one of the most common cognitive symptoms would be negative, just negative beliefs. And kids may not verbalize these, but this idea that I'm bad, people can't be trusted, the world is an unsafe place. Again, unfortunately, for many of the kids we see, um, there's some reality to that. Um, the next. And then with um, arousal and emotional reactivity, just thinking, I'm not sure how many folks here are in the ER, um, but I know this is one of the ones where we're also thinking about BHIP crisis. And so, you know, you can see how some of the um, symptoms of arousal, like physical aggression or significant risk-taking behavior could end up with a presentation in the emergency room, right? Not just primary care, um, but being aware that those are also sometimes um, part of sequelae to um, trauma. Um, sleep problems, again, which I'll talk about are really common. And so um, both problems, both falling asleep and staying asleep, and then sort of new onset of fear of sleep, fear of going to sleep at all, or fear of sleeping on their own. And then dissociative symptoms, um, you know, it's some, and that would mean, I'll talk a little bit about what these are, but in cases where um, there's more sort of prolonged trauma, um, some present, in addition to other PTSD symptoms, may have episodes of dissociation. Um, and these wouldn't be attributable to things like an absence seizure, um, but would really be trauma related. Um, and those can include feeling like not part of one's body, um, or feeling like the world around them is not real. Um, and then in some cases, these can lead to, those for those with dissociative symptoms, um, there unfortunately can be higher rates of aggression, suicidality, and also interpersonal problems. Dissociative symptoms are also associated with higher rates of physical symptoms and overlap. So again, it's not 
sort of part of the core symptoms of dissociation, um, but there are higher rates of physical symptoms. Um, and then you could imagine how sort of feeling detached from one's body um, and and feeling, you know, with the world feeling sort of unreal, you can see how there could be sort of overlap um, or potential concern about psychotic symptoms. Um, I will say that, you know, a history of trauma in childhood is actually a risk factor for later development of a psychotic disorder. So, um, you know, this sort of all on a spectrum. Um, and then this is really just to, you know, again, these are things you guys are seeing this all the time, right? That um, trauma, depending on when it occurs, um, you know, this is just a really simplified, like, kind of uh, figure of, of when different parts of the brain are developing. And so you can imagine trauma, depending on when it happens, could be disruptive to sort of different um, different systems or different um, neuro, neural connections. Um, so for but a good example of this, so um, in adults, for example, um, trauma is associated with increased perception of threat and increased response to potential threatening stimuli. Whereas for children, depending on when it happens, it can be associated with a decreased perception of threat and decreased sort of ability to discrim discriminate safe and unsafe situations. Um, so, you know, as I suggested before, trauma really impacts neurodevelopment um, and connectivity. And so, again, when it happens, um, really, it can have a different presentation. And so some people have really talked about, should we be thinking of this really as a neurodevelopmental disorder um, when it occurs in childhood because of its potential impact on overall development? Um, any questions before I move on to different part of the presentation, I can also answer them at the end, but. Yeah, feel free to place any questions in the yeah. chat or you can also use the Q&A function as well. Um, in terms of, so I alluded to before in terms of, so the next section is really on like who gets PTSD, right? And and that, you know, thankfully the, um, you know, unfortunately trauma is common amongst those who experience it really, um, there, it's estimated about a quarter of people go on to develop PTSD, um, but there are characteristics either of the type of trauma or um, characteristics of the child. So, um, you know, girls are more likely um, with exposure to traumatic event to develop PTSD symptoms, um, and some of this may uh, relate to the experiences of different types of trauma by gender. Um, and then those who have a pre-existing mental health um, challenges are more, once once exposed to trauma, maybe more likely to develop PTSD as well. Um, in terms of family characteristics, so, you know, sort of the, I know in, in pediatrics, there's a lot of discussion around sort of toxic stress and being able to, and, and one of the biggest buffers um, for um, exposure to toxic stress is being in an environment where you have sort of a safe, um, some sense of like caregiver attachment to your caregiver. So the sort of opposite, right, if there are challenges with that, um, there also can be increased risk of uh, sequelae like PTSD. Um, in terms of, you know, and again, this is sort of just for um, for sort of background when you see patients in terms of thinking about, okay, what's their what's their risk given I'm seeing a kid who has experienced this of, of later developing PTSD. Um, in the early two, 2000s, there was um, a study that really looked at different types of trauma and then um, subsequently inter interviewed folks um, to assess for PTSD. Um, and somewhat not surprisingly with our clinical experiences, right? The, the um, some types of trauma were significantly more likely to later lead to PTSD symptoms. So things, and again, you'll see a lot of these are really um, interpersonal, um, the sort of more closely interpersonal, right? Um, there are, there are um, more likely to be associated with later development of PTSD. So specifically or particularly sexual assault, rape, physical abuse, um, and then kidnapping. So I've talked about this before, right? But that, um, you know, 
fewer than 25% of kids um, who are in treatment for trauma-related psychopathology met criteria for PTSD. Just because you don't have PTSD doesn't mean you don't have significant other sequelae. And we've talked a little bit about the sort of shortcomings of that actual diagnosis. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, again, to sort of tie back to what we talked about before in terms of the experience of trauma during development and how that can have some overlap. Um, there has been a suggestion of really um, coming up with sort of a new way of formulating this, because again, we're missing if we really look at, and I think you guys are probably the best example of this in terms of like, we're not just going to address something if someone formally meets criteria for a disorder um, versus not. Um, so in some ways, this is sort of splitting hairs. Um, so, you know, some folks has, have talked about the the sequelae of trauma can really be grouped um, in kids into um, a few different sort of buckets, um, including disturbances of attention, um, <clears throat> dysregulation, and interpersonal um, difficulties. Um, and these folks do a nice job of really looking at, you can see how a lot of these have um, significant overlap with other disorders. So aggression and mood lability, um, proneness to negative emotions, all of those, again, if you look at things like ADHD, depression, um, other types of mood disorders, um, and, um, you know, behavior disorders, there is a lot of overlap. I'm going to skip this, but most, but I think folks have access to the slides, but this really, you know, again, this is just another way to think about trauma and really thinking about, um, you know, should we be thinking about different domains and kids? So again, just going back to this, um, really, we need to be more sort of um, sensitive to development and also um, to how things present over time and the sort of long-term impact that they might have. So, um, you know, I think these are different, again, with, with um, differing age, there can be differing presentations in the sort of as sequelae to trauma. So, um, again, in infancy, so you can see here in infancy, you know, trouble feeding, trouble being soothed are really some of the most um, common potential presentations. And I think folks see that, you know, obviously with, um, with or without presentation or with or without um, exposure to trauma. Um, when you look at, you know, you, you could see uh, regression in language or motor skills um, in trauma, in toddlers, um, kids may have trouble with separations, they might be more irritable and reactive, and we're really looking for sort of a change um, versus, you know, some kids that we see that really their sort of temperament has been, they might be more difficult to soothe regardless. Um, Again, in, in preschool age, I won't go through all of these, but you can see really when kids start to become school age, you might see a little bit more overlap with what we talk about sort of as the, the core sort of adult focus PTSD symptoms. And then as adolescents, um, there's more, um, you know, they, they may have more autonomy or may be able to present in different ways in terms of the types of behaviors that you would end up seeing. Um, I will skip. L Lily, how am I doing on time? You're doing great. I have 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so some manifestations, does this, you know, for folks who have, um, you know, experience or seen kids in the office, anything you would add to this list in terms of what you might see in preschool age children? So ages five and below. You know, again, you'll see changes in play, changes in sleep, um, potentially changes in um, in development in terms of potentially regression from previously learned skills. And then somatic complaints um, are common as well. And then in school age children, um, you know, they might start to be able to more verbalize um, why they don't want to go somewhere versus um, in younger kids, it might just be they have the behavior, they won't go somewhere, but they can't really explain um, that they don't want to go. Um, you might, you know, again, as kids become school, you'll start to see increasing sort of school related functions. So you might catch um, sort of poor attention and concentration, um, even if it's impacted somebody who's younger, once they're in school, the demands are increased. Um, 
that may um, tend to present more. So not uncommonly, we see kids who are exposed to trauma who there's concern about potential ADHD. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about comorbidity of those as well. Um, and again, I talked a little bit about this, but for adolescents, there may be more um, externalizing behavior. So um, oppositional behavior, aggression, um, Again, the sense of increased risk-taking behavior, all of which might, you know, lead to an emergency room presentation and um, for what might thought be thought to be just disruptive behavior. Um, so in terms of comorbidities, um, just to kind of go through some of the commonly, the conditions that are commonly com comorbid with PTSD. So um, kids with ADHD, um, you know, there are a lot of these, you'll see they're sort of bi-directional, right? So um, kids with ADHD have a greater likelihood of developing PTSD and some, there's some question, right? Does impulsive behavior lead to higher likelihood of traumatic events or is there kind of the same thing that's sort of preceding both of them? Um, importantly, I think as it relates to sort of a practical treatment guide, um, because alpha agonists can treat sort of hyper arousal symptoms that might be present both in ADHD and, and um, PTSD. If you have a kid that has symptoms of both, that might be that there are times, for example, you know, we typically recommend starting with stimulants for ADHD, but if they've got really, you know, significant hyper arousal symptoms or difficulty sleeping, um, that might be a time when you'd consider starting with an alpha agonist like guanfacine or even clonidine. Um, in terms of anxiety, really for anxiety and depression, and I'll get to this a little bit later, but some of the, um, you know, they're often comorbid and there are sometimes um, higher rates if you have um, depressive disorders like of later developing PTSD and vice versa. Um, SSRIs, and I'll get to this a little bit later, but SSRIs, there's really not evidence for improvement of PTSD symptoms alone. Um, but in a kid who has, um, it looks, seems like symptoms really of both, um, that would be a time to think about um, medication treatment with SSRI for PTSD comorbid with either um, anxiety or depressive disorders. I talked a little bit about this before that um, in terms of the relationship between PTSD and psychosis, sometimes the symptoms can appear um, to be, or there may be concern for psychosis as a presentation of PTSD, but that also, um, unfortunately, trauma is a risk factor for later development of psychosis. Um, and then um, with substance use disorders, um, you know, substance use, there's again, bi-directional relationships. So substance use may increase someone's risk for traumatic experiences, but also might be used um, to, you um, self-medicate some of the more distressing symptoms of PTSD. Um, in terms of the role of caregivers, and we'll get to a little bit of this um, as we talk about um, resilience, but you know, oftentimes we see families that are exposed to the same traumatic event, right? And so when the parent has experienced an event, um, and, and we see this with anxiety as well, right? That there's sort of, there can be modeling. So if the parent experiences the world as unsafe, that is can be sort of passed on um, in the way that um, they sort of go about things with the kids. So um, it similarly to anxiety disorders where there, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of work in helping the parent um, be able to to help the the a lot of the treatment relates to sort of exposure in a gradual sense to the distressing um, whether it's a distressing thought or an anxiety right if a kid is afraid of going to school um, the parent has to be able to tolerate the distress of the child um, but also be able to signal and again as as I had mentioned before there are times when um, things are sort of objectively unsafe so we definitely wouldn't encourage a parent to invalidate the child's concern, but I think there's also, you know, being aware of whether the parent is having really significant symptoms and whether that could be modeling um, those symptoms for the child. Um, in terms of assessment for trauma and for PTSD, um, you know, the role I would say of the pediatric provider, and these you guys know this better than I do, so there's really um, identification, 
um, education about trauma, promoting resilience, which I think is really, um, you know, important and critical, and then um, potentially treating. So the other things, and again, this relates to sort of trauma-informed care, is being aware that sometimes healthcare settings can be a really significant trigger. So I've seen, you know, I saw one patient where they had so much difficulty even going into the office, I ended up meeting with them outside. Um, and so the sight of being in the office was distressing enough to them um, that they, um, you know, have real difficulty with it. If there's concerns, for example, we see this on, on um, inpatient unit and probably in the ER as well, right? There may be loud noises, there may be need for their um, need for restraints, and that could also be a challenge we see on our inpatient unit. Um, sounds, and again, some of this might be sounds related to the trauma that the child experienced. Some of it might be just they're more easily aroused. Um, and so again, you could imagine how, depending on the environment, even just being in the office might be um, potential um, trigger for kids. Um, in terms of ways to address that, um, and I think these are things that, again, really go more into sort of the trauma-informed care, but, um, you know, asking, talking about procedures before you're doing things, again, in many cases, there's a sense of loss of control and trauma. And so being able to like include um, the child and the family and some of the decisions to the degree possible and giving back, uh, giving some of the control back is important. Um, you know, and again, really assuming potentially that any patient, because we're particularly for the youngest patient may have experienced trauma and sort of treating accordingly. In terms of trauma screening tools, um, sort of the the punch, I guess I was gonna go actually first to just asking about trauma because I guess what I will say in pediatric settings is there's, you know, there's a number of sort of valid, sort of validated tools, but you'll see there's um, limitations for them. So they don't really address all the domains. And I think really to start with, um, the AAP recommends asking open-ended questions. And so we've tried this. I know I've worked with a practice where they tried just asking the question, has anything scary or upsetting happened since the last visit? And then following with questions. Um, and then really asking about, um, you know, if there are specific events, asking about trauma-related symptoms. Um, I'll go back to these. These are just examples. And I again, I think folks will have um, access to the slides. So some of them, so the one on the bottom right is not necessarily, again, it's like these are just some of the evidence-based assessments, but I don't think um, some of them are necessarily feasible for, um, you know, doing them in primary care. So these really just go over some of the different screeners and then some of the sort of pros and cons of doing each of them. Um, in terms of assessment, so once you've screened um, someone, say they screen positive, um, thinking about, um, you know, whether or the importance of really uh, differentiating. And part of that, again, is if the child, we, we have more sort of available in the arsenal of treatment from a medication standpoint for other disorders, um, like ADHD, anxiety, and depression than we do for trauma. So really getting a sense of um, whether there are other disorders present, um, recognize, and, so, and then also thinking about, so some symptoms are more easily attributable to a traumatic event versus a kid who, who's just presenting the only obvious sort of external symptom is concentration problems, um, which might more easily be um, sort of construed as maybe just an attention problem. Um, Folks know this, but the importance of, you know, the ch especially younger children may not recall or even want to discuss details of an event. And so to the degree that you can obtain collateral information, we spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I will say as in my role as a psychiatrist, you know, if somebody's already gotten some of the um, some of the information, I oftentimes will acknowledge that I've heard it, but, you know, not asking somebody to repeat the same, particularly if it's a one time um, if it's the like one time you're going to be seeing them or you won't be seeing them that frequently, you know, avoiding having someone um, 
sort of have to retell the story to the degree possible. And part of that relates to having control over um, the narrative and who you're sort of sharing it with. Um, and then, you know, because of the um, increase in risk for suicide um, and or risk taking behavior, making sure that that's um, also part of what um, you do in the follow up assessment. Um, I'm going to skip this, but these are, again, just signs of potential signs of trauma exposure. We've sort of gone over that before, but this is a nice, like, um, kind of practical um, guide that you'll, um, we provided the um, reference for. In terms of treatments, um, so, you know, again, one of the most important things, um, you know, particularly in the office is to provide education um, and particularly to caregivers. Um, and so um, there's a lot of detail on here, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, particularly for the younger, for younger kids where their behavior might not be very um, understandable to the family or even in the school setting. So some of this is providing um, information to the parents around, um, you know, kind of understanding how to interpret the child's behavior or helping them advocate to the school in terms of um, helping the school formulate what's going on. So for example, if a kid is having really significant temper tantrums or, um, you know, helping the family reinterpret that versus, you know, the natural, I think all of our natural experience sometimes is to experience frustration with the kid, um, but really to sort of help them understand. Um, both what the symptoms are like, but also the times when it may resurface again. So if there are triggers, um, you know, being aware that that can, it may um, sort of set off a response that someone wasn't necessarily prepared for. Um, in terms of the typical components of treatment, so we talked a little bit about caregiver education, and I, at the end, I'll um, share some, some resources that we sometimes use. Um, again, the importance of thinking about resilience factors. So, um, you know, if the care, particular thinking about social support within the family, so if the caregiver is really struggling, um, helping support them so that they're able to, again, create that environment for the child. Um, Helping provide, you know, another thing that can be helpful really um, in general really is, is having routines and being able to kind of, particularly if something sort of happens that's unexpected and there's such a disruption, really helping them um, re-establish um, some routines that might have been um, disrupted, particularly for younger kids where that's a really important part of um, sort of helping them have some predictability. I'll talk a little bit about some of the psychosocial treatments that are available. Um, and then I talked a little bit about how our medication um, treatments are really, there's a pretty limited evidence base for that right now. Um, so we talked a little bit about, you know, what are some of the resilience factors that we might be able to help folks with. Um, so, you know, again, thinking, helping the kids, helping a kid maybe think through like what might be, for example, um, what might be how they approach a situation, um, how they might appraise, you know, the, the tendency after trauma, right, is to potentially appraise everything negatively. And so are there areas where you, we can help sort of reframe that? Um, again, focusing on family routines and relationships, um, and then again, providing education um, related to um, sort of other systems that kids may um, interact with. Um, I, you know, again, I think this is stuff that is kind of increasingly being recognized in terms of what are some positive, what are positive child experiences that we want to help families experience um, that can help um, with resilience in the context of trauma. So, you know, our families, can we help families be able to um, to develop these experiences with kids. So being able to talk with their family about feelings, um, feeling protected by their families. And this really just looks at, um, you know, the, the experience or having had positive experiences and later um, odds of things like depression in adulthood and really the importance of um, sort of reinforcing these when we see kids. 
In terms of the treatments, again, this is really a, just an overview in terms of the, the um, sort of range of treatments that we have available. Most of them include um, a number of components, including psychoeducation about trauma and um, common responses to trauma. Oftentimes there's some training in being in emotion regulation, and that may be whether it's sort of um, related to sort of relaxation or also being able to sort of reframe things when possible. Um, similar to anxiety, um, exposure is oftentimes in a safe way, um, being able to, for trauma, sometimes that's eventually being able to retell the narrative versus in anxiety disorders, we think about exposure to this sort of external thing such as school or, um, you know, any range of things that kids are um, kind of exposed to and then really um, helping them develop problem solving skills. And some of that goes back to when they experience challenges. I think in the context of trauma, when you're really aroused, it can be really hard to, to kind of take a step back and look at like, what are the potential solutions to this? And so helping sort of re-scaffold with that um, is oftentimes a part of treatments for trauma. Um, and then depending on the age, obviously for younger kids, the, similarly to other um, interventions that we have, the younger the child, the more parental invo involvement we end up having. Um, as I talked about before, um, for kids, unlike for adults, SSRIs, if you have a kid who has just PTSD and you know not evidence for any other um, type of disorders, there's really um, not a lot of evidence for SSRIs, which is, again, for adults, there's actually um, better evidence for that. Um, and here's where I'm mentioning some off-label uses, again, because we don't have any on-label trauma-related in indications for kids. Um, but there is increasing evidence for use of um, prazosin for reducing nightmare and nightmares and sleep disorder, um, sleep disturbances in pediatric um, patients, although we haven't gotten to the point where there have been um, sort of large randomized controlled trials. And then similarly, um, alpha agonists have some um, evidence um, for uh, reducing some hyperarousal symptoms in PTSD, but they've been really less um, kind of rigorously studied in pediatric populations. Um, this is a nice, um, you know, again, this was um, sort of a, an algorithm for those of you who like those in terms of like, um, you know, when do we start to think about medications in PTSD? So here uh, at the top of the algorithm, they really, again, because sleep disturbance is one of the things. So for prazosin um, that we that we have, you know, something that has some evidence, we start with thinking about um, is there um, evidence of having that? Um, and is it enough that it would prevent, you know, again, the, the really the cornerstone is um, trauma-focused therapy versus starting right away with medication. But if you have disturbance to the point that it's really interfering in the ability, or, you know, if you're, if they don't have access to some of those services, that might be a time when you might think about something um, like starting with prazosin. Um, and then similarly, if there are, um, if there's hyperarousal and there's concern about that, you could also think about something like wanfacine or clonidine. And then at the bottom, it looks like, you know, once you've treated that, is there evidence that there is uh, a comorbid disorder that might respond to an SSRI, in which case then you would think about that. But you'll see SSRIs are pretty far down on the algorithm for trauma. Um, I think folks are probably familiar with the National um, Childhood Traumatic Stress Network, but they have lots and lots of resources, including videos, handouts for families um, that can be really helpful to either have available in the office or, you know, after certain events. They're, they've been pretty good about when kind of events happen. For example, hurricanes, there's oftentimes sort of updated um, resources for that. Um, they also include resources related to treatment for trauma. Um, I think that is all I have for the didactic portion, but happy to answer questions that folks have. Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We will open it up for any questions that you all have. Um, you can, again, use the chat function or also the Q&A.
Um, so feel free to place any questions you have there. Thank you. I was trying to look at the, um, thank you for putting all of these in. Yes, all the resources that were placed in the chat too will be sent to you in a list afterwards as well. So you have a list of related resources, the slides, and also the recording of the presentation. Oh, we had a question pop in. Yes, um, I see. So my practice is, um, so um, tell me the when it says any resources locally, um, where is locally for you? Just so I can make sure I answer the question. Is it Lee? I'm not sure how to say the last name. I do see a number of kids from, you're in Baltimore County. Yes. Um, so I do see a number of kids from, that's a lot of my practice actually is, is kids from Central America, many of whom um, don't have health insurance. Um, I would say in Baltimore County, but really for all of you guys, there are a number of places that, um, and probably the best um, thing I would recommend would be actually to call BHIP because they keep an updated list, including wait times, right? So of like, I, I'm seeing a patient with this. You know, we have our, our I, my clinic is over at Johns Hopkins Bayview, but like everywhere their places have varying um, weights. Um, there are an increasing number of, I think in the city, I know that there's um, folks who, um, who have, you know, there are specific programs, for example, for unaccompanied minors, um, but that may vary in terms of whether they take folks in the city or county. There, so yeah, so a lot of these questions are things I think that that we keep up that BHIP, the folks in BHIP keep updating. There are, you know, I can speak to this. There are, um, there is in the Baltimore area, there's sort of a listserv of Spanish speaking therapists. The other place I would say is, um, is I feel like they just changed. It used to be LURS and maybe it's now Global Refuge. Um, there are a number of, um, and I know that they really focus on um, seeing folks who are also uninsured. They're, you called them and no one called back. Um, yeah, so that would be a time, um, you know, I can certainly, we can certainly pass that on, but I think we can also provide additional um, references. And Lily, I don't know if it would make sense to we could even reach out to the BHIP line folks and say, would that be helpful? We could like send you resources and sort of include it in separately. If you want to send me an email, feel free to, and I can pass that yes. along to our yeah. uh, mental health specialists that help out with identifying local resources. Yeah. But I also have your name down so I can, I can take note of it. Let's see. Um, I totally agree with you. Um, and I know that there is efforts to do, you know, there are, I know in Baltimore City Schools, they train another, a number of folks in um, interventions that are also delivered in schools. Um, and in part because schools um, are where a lot of the kids um, are seen. And there there are, there's an uh, intervention called CBITS that has good, I know they've delivered it in Baltimore City Schools before and the University of Maryland um, has a national sort of school-based mental health program. They do a lot of work with that. Um, yes, for um, with, with diagnosing ADHD, let's see, do I have a preference? Um, we sometimes use the, the um, PTSD reaction index. We have, um, I have, you know, I have access to it in my clinic. Um, it's paid, but I think that there are ways to get access to it in general pediatric practices. Um, you know, in terms of the screeners, I think again, because they all have their shortcomings, uh, the new MD program, yeah, I can we can email later that it's it's called CBITS. Um, and it's sort of a group-based intervention that was designed for delivery in schools. Um in terms of like, is there a, a screener that I use? So sometimes we use that, but I think there are also so many limitations that really like making sure I'm asking about the, um, you know, the core areas and if they have, 
you know, so for example, are they experiencing nightmares? Um, there, there's limitations for all of the screeners that we have right now. So I guess that I will leave it at that. Um, we have two questions in the Q&A here. We have, you briefly mentioned RAD at the beginning of your presentation. What is the relationship between RAD and PTSD? Yeah, so, so um, RAD, which is uh, reactive attachment disorder really is, so it's often seen a little bit more, again, it's a, a um, presentation that's in, earlier in childhood. Um, and so I think that those kids and a lot of the sort of disinhibited social engagement disorder. So I think a lot of those may end up potentially developing into that sort of a marker or a, um, a sequelae of trauma that's a slightly different pe presentation, um, but I think would increase risk for later development of post-traumatic distress uh, stress disorder or really kind of evolve into those symptoms. I don't know if that answers your question. We have another question too. Are not all therapists able to do trauma? Do therapists need to be trained specially? Um, so there are special, you know, in an ideal world, um, there are, we would, because there are so many, and I, and I think the other part of it is because it can be, um, you know, potentially challenging and we want to really be able to help develop, help the kids develop attachment to them and treating it appropriately. There are, um, there are components of it, but I wouldn't say that all therapists are trained in, um, things like trauma-focused CBT. The nice thing is there's been a lot of effort to make some of these trainings. You know, there's training and then there's ongoing supervision. Um, and so there have been efforts to, um, there's free training available for trauma-focused CBT, but I think a really important part of what we do is also like, how do people, do people have places or, or folks who have a lot of experience um, in managing trauma? Do they have the supervision to be able to continue delivering that versus just receiving the training without longitudinal assistance? We had something else pop into the chat. I find that preschool children with PTSD will be expelled from mm -hmm. daycare centers due to the extreme tantrums. This was when my patient was on the wait list for KKI trauma clinic sometimes ACT will help any other resources. Yeah, I mean, so for folks, you know, again, this is, some of it may be um, specific, like uh, geography specific, but we have, you know, at Bayview, there's a preschool intensive outpatient program and they have, you know, there's, and that can be really helpful. So if the kid is really like, and in, in this case of someone, um, I don't know if they're in the Baltimore city area, but if they're, functioning, if they've been kicked out of, um, you know, their daycare, that's a pretty significant impairment in function. And if the families are able to do sort of an intensive program, um, they're oftentimes they, they do, I mean, it, it, it varies, but we, I not infrequently, if you are in the Baltimore city area, reaching out to Bayview, they oftentimes have spots and they work. The one thing about that is they work pretty intensively. So it's, um, both the parent and the child go, um, I think they can be flexible in, in terms of the number of days per week, but it's usually like several hours per day and they do a lot of work. And I think they're pretty, you know, they see, uh, they, they, there's a lot of um, experience there in terms of working with traumatized children and families. Cause that's a huge, you know, component often of presentation in preschool. It looks like that provider said they're in Harford. Yeah. Um, someone yeah. put in the center, for, the center for Infant Study at University of Maryland, they see kids yeah. um, from zero to five um, as another reason. We can, yeah, and we can certainly, Lily, I don't know if it's possible like to stand out for those, uh, maybe I'm, uh, <laughs> but, but to take note of like who wants particular mm -hmm. resources in their area, because I feel like mm -hmm. that would not, you know, we can come up with some of the lists. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll take note of that. Um, we have another question. Is there a late relationship between trauma exposure and the development of autism? Yeah. Um, so um I think 
So in terms of formal development of, I mean, I think you can definitely see developmental regression. I think that's an area people are sort of wondering about. And I think it could go sort of in both ways, but you're thinking like trauma exposure first and later development of autism um, or the other way, you know, there's certainly risk sort of the other way around. Um, but um, I don't, I think that's an area where, you know, autism itself is sort of so heterogeneous in terms of how it presents that I think you could certainly have a picture that way. And I think we're realizing like, again, there's, as we think of, you would think, we would hope that we're, we look at the different symptoms that kids are experiencing and then sort of understand. Um, so for autism, I'm thinking about people have varying levels of challenges in different domains and thinking about why um, that is. But you, I could see that you know, they could present similarly in some ways, right? In terms of like restricted um, interactions with other folks, also restricted activities potentially, um, you know, I think, so you could certainly see it presenting similarly. Okay, do we have any other questions before we wrap up? Give everybody a minute. I'm happy to, um, I'll put my contact information. Um, if anybody has like particular questions or want to reach out, I'm happy to field those to the degree possible. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So thank you again for this wonderful presentation, Dr. Platt, and to our participants in today's session. Um, just again, as a reminder, the recording for today's session, the slides and a list of related resources will be available on our website next week. We will send CME and CEU certificates to participants by November 7th. So please remember to take the survey as you exit as this is required if you'd like to receive CME or CEU credit. We'll also send out the survey via email. Um, and stay tuned for our future BHIP trainings by following us on social media. And thank you so much again, and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks, guys. Thank you.